a special seminar today uh, provided by the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research. It's my pleasure that uh, Dr. Rob Burnett will be speaking to us on Cyber Knife uh, and the opportunities that this might afford both the University of Waterloo and the Grand River Regional Cancer Center. Uh, I'm not going to speak very much at this point. I'm going to let Dominic Covey, the uh, founding director of the Institute, introduce Rob, and then Rob can get right into his presentation. So thank you all for coming today. Well, it's good to see people here today. I know it's the summertime, and uh, getting uh, people in here is always challenging. I was remarking to Shirley about this time last year, we had uh, a boot camp, and uh, with five days of the hottest days of the summer, we had people where we had to practically give them intravenous water to keep them going. But uh, Rob, welcome. Rob is a, a, a fixture around the University of Waterloo. Um, he works with the Department of Physics quite a bit, and I notice he has an engineering student as well. Uh, Rob did his PhD in radiological physics from the University of Calgary and has a fellowship status with the Canadian College of Medical Physicists, which he got in the same year as uh, he got his degree. Um, uh, Rob's worked with the uh, Cross Cancer Institute in Edmonton as a medical physicist. He co-developed uh, tr a tre provincial treatment planning system uh, that was in clinical use for 15 years. And uh, his research interests, which can be, kind of be derived from that, include radiation dosimetry and 3D dose calculation algorithms. He's currently supervising two PhD students, a physics student, related to uh, incorporating organ motion. Uh, in treatment planning, and an engineering student who's building a radiation dosimeter for, uh, using carbon nanotube, uh, carbon nanotube technology. So very pleased to have Rob here. This will be the first of a two-part interaction with Rob. Uh, this was really a chance for people to get to know about this work, including ourselves. Uh, this is not a, an area which I'm deeply familiar. And then in September, probably, late in September, we'll have another one of these uh, we've had a chance to kind of uh, circulate the slides, find out more interest. So anyone you know who might be interested in any of the topics uh, that you see here today, we greatly appreciate knowing his or her name. And uh, secondly, uh, we will be circulating a, an announcement of the opportunity to work on this uh, project uh, uh, to those and everybody in the Institute. So please let us know about that. We've already contacted some people related to uh, the area of the tissue effects of radiation. And you'll see that plays an important role in this particular technology. So Rob, welcome. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, um, I'm actually presenting on behalf of um, uh, two other individuals that uh, make up the leadership of the radiation program at the Cancer Center. Um, Mark Berry is the um, clinical director, and uh, Dalit Panjwani um, is the MD. Um, he is the medical director. The, um, it's, it's interesting that uh, Dominique would talk about two years ago during the heat wave. Actually, about one year ago, there was also a, uh, a workshop uh, here, um, and there was uh, some discussion about uh, possibly forming a, a separate uh, imaging group because there was a lot of interest in, in uh, uh, imaging uh, and a lot of expertise within the group. Um, at that time, we forecasted um, um, some of the, the projects that we were working on at the Cancer Center, uh, including the implementation of intensity modulated radiation therapy, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit of detail. Um, the upgrading of one of our linear accelerators to include uh, kilovoltage verification imaging, um, also referred to as uh, onboard imaging uh, by the, the vendor Varian, and uh, the possibility of something called CyberKnife, which is essentially robotic radio surgery. And uh, the whole purpose of coming here today actually was to um, basically uh, to extend um, an invitation to. Uh, uh, people here at the University of Waterloo to talk about possible research projects associated with such a device. And um, since uh, coming here in 2001, um, we've been active with the physics department and we've been active um, um, with uh, the engineering group as well. 
But this is really open to the university in terms of interest and possible projects. And I'll talk a little bit more about the technology. Um, the, um, the real point is that as a function of time, um, the cancer center, uh, uh, the patients being referred to the cancer center increase. And eventually you get into a, a situation where you have to um, expand your resources. And we're in a situation now where we're at the crossroads. And the question is, do we just go out and get a conventional linear accelerator and, uh, and, and basically um, um, uh, just, just continue in a, in a conservative way? Or do we take hold of this as an opportunity to bring in a newer technology? Um, and, and really, that's what this talk is about. And, and the talk in the fall are going to be about. Uh, the other um, uh, thing I wanted to say is that there is a, a huge opportunity for informatics development associated with this technology. So that's actually a weakness with it. And uh, so I throw that out as well, as that I um, um, said this last year, that um, there was the opportunity uh, for that. But anyway, um, what I'm going to talk about before I, I uh, detail uh, robotic radio surgery and CyberKnife is uh, essentially the new paradigm in radiation oncology. And that paradigm is generally referred to as adoptive radiation therapy or image-guided radiation therapy. Um, and there's a number of uh, processes, sub-processes, all vital to basically the implementation of this, or full implementation of this. And uh, just going from top to bottom on the side, um, you need to have uh, different um, uh, imaging modalities uh, working for you. Um, the CT, uh, conventional CT, is no longer, um, no longer actually provides uh, sufficient soft tissue contrast for all of the, the cancers that you want to treat. Um, functional imaging uh, through PET is also extremely important, um, particularly for, for lung patients in terms of identifying um, what we will, will, will refer to as the um, the planning target volume um, that, um, that we basically deliver radiation to. Um, in addition, you need to have uh, fast and efficient contouring tools or segmentation tools. And so when you have the digital anatomy, you need to be able to sweep through the anatomy and identify uh, contours and, and uh, regions um, that in fact become part of an objective function um, in the planning process. And so what you do is you basically identify uh, target volumes and volumes that you want to avoid with the radiation and then set up a, an objective function um, and you basically um, um, optimize the radiation coverage uh, from that objective function. And uh, the technology uh, as well requires being able to shape the radiation fields. To shape the radiation fields, we're working with a technology called multi-leaf collimation. And this is interleaved tungsten alloy materials that basically we can control the position and the duration of stay so that you can dynamically or statically define the radiation which emerges from the uh, head of the uh, linear accelerator. Um, so that's a very key uh, piece of this puzzle as well. And then um, uh, lastly, um, and this is where the image guided piece is, um, is, is, um, is, is really detailed. You need to have verification imaging. You need to know that the planned radiation, in fact, was delivered. Um, and, and if it wasn't, you need to know potentially how you're going to re-steer it, um, re-optimize. Um, and so you need to have verification imaging technology built onto your treatment unit. Um, and then lastly, the informatics piece, which is huge. Um, the amount of data now, because everything is, is going towards image-guided technology, um, you need to have uh, the ability to store vast amounts of information. You need to be able to pull it up quickly. You need to be able to compare and make decisions on it on the fly. And so that piece is the real challenge uh, right now, frankly, in terms of moving forward with, this, this, uh, with image-guided technology. Now, what I'm describing to you is basically linear accelerator associated. And there are a number of new devices. One of them is uh, tomotherapy, helical tomotherapy. Um, this is a device where the patient is actually drawn through a, um, a, um, a high energy, um, uh, well, a, a linear accelerator, but it also has megavoltage imaging capability in it. And another technology is uh, CyberKnife, which is robotic radio surgery. And the CyberKnife technology is such that the, um, the delivery of the radiation 
is actually part of a tracking system. And so you define the tumor, and the system is actually tracking with uh, uh, motion, uh, for example, for a lung tumor. And um, the, the idea is that um, you are delivering the radiation uh, very precisely. Um, as part of clinical trials, um, there is a group called the Advanced, uh, I'm sorry, there is a group called the Advanced Technology um, uh, Consortium. And this group was formed um, at an ASTRO meeting uh, several years ago. And um, what, they, what they did basically was put together um, a, an infrastructure that allows you to share information with new technologies in particular. And so right now, they're on the leading edge of what, what I would call a DICOM RT-based PACS system, allowing you to, to uh, uh, share information and store and retrieve information related to DICOM RT structures. Um, and I won't uh, waste a, a lot of time talking in detail about this. But it's this informatics piece that we need to basically come to grips with um, um, as, as a part of moving forward with image-guided radiation therapy. Um, I mentioned adaptive radiation therapy. Adaptive radiation therapy is a superset of image-guided radiation therapy. And really, what you're talking about with adaptive radiation therapy is a feedback loop on the imaging piece. Because as we treat patients, tumors regress. Um, patient's anatomy changes. And so you need to deal with the fact that if you're trying to avoid parotid as part of a head and neck treatment, that uh, the, the tumor itself may be shrinking. And so the proximity of the parotid to that tumor uh, will be changing. And so you need to dynamically decide whether or not the original plan is suitable partway along the, the radiation delivery. Um, and and um, part of uh, what's currently being referred to as adoptive radiation therapy includes deformable dose registration. Um, so these, uh, these are techniques that right now are part of um, uh, what's called adaptive radiation therapy. And this particular diagram was stolen from uh, um, an address uh, given at Astro last year by Dr. Uh, Kupilian. Um, and just stealing his slide on the upper left-hand side, you're going from basically 3D conformal IMRT with imaging techniques uh, in the room, generally referred to as image-guided uh, technique, to dose evalu evaluation techniques, so dose-guided radiation therapy. And dose-guided radiation therapy uh, uh, predominantly now is, is, is basically being offered through technologies such as tomotherapy, um, but could be part of what CyberKnife is as well. It's just that, um, and then finally the adaptive piece where, uh, in fact, you, because of anatomical changes, because of um, um, uh, changes to the patient, you, in fact, uh, loop back and basically um, replan the patient and then modify dose delivery uh, uh, along the way. Well, I just wanted to talk about um, inverse planning, some of the components for those that aren't familiar with image guided and what this technology is about fairly quickly. Um, we talk about inverse planning. This is a nine beam head and neck patient, just as an example. Um, P3 IMRT is a commercial product we work with. Uh, it's um, offered by Philips. Um, the treatment planning system is called Pinnacle. And what you have basically is the digital anatomy of the patient. And I mentioned before, you have to identify contours, which are, are part of the patient's treatment, uh, planning target volume, organs at risk that you want to avoid. And then associated with those objects are uh, dosimetry constraints. And within the, the, um, the pinnacle infrastructure, um, we work with concepts, uh, um, uh, different concepts. Clearly, the dose at a point is the simplest to understand. We also work with a dose volume histogram, which represents um, basically the volume uh, coverage associated um, with, with the structure. And you can define um, um, what you want in terms of the weighting and um, the exact coverage and the exact avoidance. Um, and then you go through an optimization process, whereby you're basically minimizing uh, an objective function. And um, from the initial constraints, the, um, the solution uh, to this, um, to this uh, problem is basically a fluence map for each of the directions that you've uh, pre-decided on. And so in fact, um, this particular optimization problem is geared to shaping the intensity of 
of your beam in order to uh, provide the dose distribution that you're looking for. Shown on the lower left of this screen is basically that, that fluence map, and that really represents the ideal, it's a mathematical solution to the optimization problem. From the mathematical solution, you then have to connect to the technology that you have in-house. And so if you've got Siemens, or you've got Electa, or you've got Varian, you translate that ideal fluence map, basically, to control points or two coordinates on the, the um, MLC, the collimation system that, uh, that you have. And um, so in our case, we have Varian. And which, what's shown here, basically, um, are the number of segments, individual segments, that are associated with one beam direction. And so for each of the beam directions, basically, you've got a series of individual segments. Um, um, or, uh, alternatively, you can deliver this dynamically. So in fact, there are two approaches uh, to, to the delivery. One is static, it's called step and shoot, and the other is dynamic, um, called, referred to by the vendor as sliding window. And then finally, having uh, translated your optimization solution into control points for your linear accelerator, you go back and you look at um, what's referred to here as the collapse cone or CC convolution dose distribution. And now you're looking at the dose on the individual slices to make sure that your coverage is, uh, is suitable. And then having done that, um, you go out and you do a lot of quality assurance testing. Uh, specifically, you have to verify that complex fluence uh, maps are, in fact, um, what, you, what you deliver. And since we don't have the patient to test that with, we use solid water or we use plastic phantoms. And we replan the, the um, um, actually, the, the, the patient plan um, through plastic so that, in fact, we can take the measurements and verify that we're getting the appropriate uh, fluence uh, uh, delivered for each port. And it's also very important to make sure that the absolute dose where it's prescribed is in fact verified um, at individual points within, uh, within the phantom as well. And I'll just uh, um, quickly go through this. And so um, basically you're doing a comparison between measured um, in this particular slide, you're using film dosimetry. So in fact, you're taking film and you're uh, digitizing it and you're comparing it um, to um, the uh, uh, calculated fluence. And the same approach can be taken for other sites as well. That was a head and neck example, but um, the same principles apply for uh, uh, prostate uh, IMRT as well. So in a nutshell, that's um, IMRT. And I just wanted to tell you a little uh, about some of the in investigative work that uh, we've been doing. Um, this particular slide uh, is from work that was, uh, that was led by uh, Grigor Grigorov uh, as, as part of our physics department. I'm pleased to say we have a growing physics department. Um, we came up from just a couple of physicists uh, in 2001 to a department that now has um, a physics resident and uh, a couple of uh, really talented uh, graduate students. and. Um, we also have uh, an extra two physicists since I think the last time I presented. So we're, we're building strength and uh, uh, strength of mind, and uh, that's really helped us uh, go forward. Anyway, um, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Grigor investigated with Varian's technology was the fact that for step and shoot delivery, depending on the dose rate, uh, you might overdose uh, in the first segment. And so by doing a segment analysis, uh, he was able to show that for the first segment, reproducibly at 600 monitor units per minute, in fact, you had a significant overdose. And that as a result of that overdose, you ended up cutting the last segment short. And so typically from your optimization solution, whatever the first segment came out as, whatever the last segment came out of, it was sort of a rob from the rich and, and give to the poor kind of thing. And um, we... Um, uh, we, we worked at this, and in fact, we developed a correction methodology for that. And you might say, well, was it significant? The clini clinical significance is, is shown basically in this slide. So in fact, what you end up doing, because typically the first segment is the largest of the series uh, in the optimization problem. Uh, as a matter of fact, you form your shape and then you shrink down, uh, just, just um, as, in terms of efficient delivery. And um, it's, it's quite possible to overdose your, um, your planning target volume. And um, 
and also overdose your rectum, um, depending on uh, what dose rate that you pick. And Varian don't really say anything about this in their technology, so in fact you can either correct it or make sure that you go to slower uh, uh, dose rates. And you might think, well, is it, is it really a problem? And, and uh, it is because you want to try and get through as many patients as possible, and so the tendency is to try and crank up the dose rate to get the beam delivered as quickly as possible, and so this particular uh, problem um, and solution um, has been uh, useful for us. Well, I won't bore you to death with the details, but we basically upgraded uh, one of our linear accelerators for, uh, to include kilovoltage imaging, um, and it started last year in December and ended uh, at the end of January. And although they told me it was just going to be a, a quick retrofit uh, over a couple of weeks, um, it's actually a rebuilding of the accelerator with the addition of three robotic arms, and so it's, it is more involved than uh, certainly Varian uh, wanted us to believe. Um, the whole cost of it was about uh, $650,000 for the verification, so it's quite an expensive um, uh, imaging system. Shown here is the high-frequency generator on the right and the robotic arm controller um, on the left. And what does this imager do for you? Well. Basically, it produces diagnostic quality images. Um, it's the diagnostic x-ray unit mounted on the head of the accelerator. However, um, it gives you two tools. Uh, potentially, it can give you uh, digital pulse digital fluoroscopy. And so uh, the only issue is that you never really image uh, through, the, um, through the actual beam unless you want to use megavoltage uh, imaging. So we had megavoltage uh, imaging as part of the original configuration. Um, that's an amorph amorphous silicon flat panel photodiode array, um, which is uh, retracted in this photo underneath the couch. But um, if we want to see basically a beam's eye view where the radiation is going, we can only do that with megavoltage imaging. Um, however, we can position um, the, um, the diagnostic unit if we're treating lung, for example at right angles to the uh, treatment beam to look at basically breathing patterns and, um, and synchronize the beam, the, de the beam delivery actually with, uh, uh, with, with the imaging. The other thing we can do, um, and this is a bit of a limitation, but I'll describe it anyway, is actually perform poor man CT uh, prior to treatment or post-treatment. And so what I mean by that is that I basically rotate and acquire images 360 degrees around the patient and then do filtered back projection uh, with a, instead of a, a, a narrow slice, now I'm working with a cone beam, and that technology has been developed uh, over, over the last few years, um, and in particular led by uh, Dr. Dave Jaffrey, um, who did some work at William Beaumont in the United States and now is head of physics at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto. And their group continues to be working very intensely on developing this technology. and. Um, so for us, uh, it was great to be able to, uh, to, to, um, to upgrade our unit and be able to go forward with this. And um, we're just in the process now of, of performing the second uh, upgrade. The, um, while he was um, uh, working as a um, physics resident, uh, Andre Fleck uh, did some development for this. This is the megavoltage portal imaging system. Um, and what he was able to do is basically build a quality assurance tool out of this that we have been working with. He did an absolute dose calibration of this. So this is now the megavoltage imaging tool. Um, um, this consists of, um, there's a, a, a metal attenuator, uh, basically a copper plate, and then there is a, um, a photo, high resolution photodiode array underneath it. And in fact, we scan this um, uh, and it produces a, basically a two-dimensional image um, extremely useful for doing uh, quality assurance of IMRT. In the original slides I was talking about film, this basically gets you away from film and it's, um, it's tremendous to have the technology. The one limitation we had with this initially is that the arm supporting the portal imager wasn't very strong and um, this is partly because this technology is growing and it's grown at a pace that um, has basically exceeded, I think, some of the practical considerations uh, in the design. And uh, um, as part of the uh, onboard imaging upgrade, we were able to upgrade the robotic, robotic arm. And the beauty of it is it means you can take your images at any angle. 
And so obviously when you're treating patients, the beam can come in from any angle and you want to do your quality assurance um, at a particular angle. And so without with sparing you the details, basically you can acquire your image um, and um, Andre was able to basically calibrate this in terms of absorbed dose. The beauty is that I can pre-calculate um, the fluence um, through a, a, a patient or a, a plastic phantom and verify that a particular uh, beam, um, and this could be a complex IMRT fluence pattern, is in fact correct coming through the phantom. So that's tremendously useful as part of IMRT quality assurance. Um, and I'll, Dominique asked me to stick to 45 minute delivery, so I'm gonna pound through this a little bit here. Because we use MATLAB and we developed this in-house, we were able to develop simple to tools for doing uh, comparisons. And so, in fact, we can look at profiles and we can look at uh, two-dimensional patterns. Um, the important part of this is that we were able to integrate it into our oncology information system. Uh, so, specifically, we work with a product called Verus, and it's important to be able to include all of the quality assurance measurements that you've taken as part of the patient record. And so, in fact, this was uh, integrated in with that. The uh, system itself um, has gone through an evolution in terms of um, the amount of uh, functionality and what you can do with images. This shows an initial version of the software in which I'm comparing a mega voltage image for a breast patient on the left-hand side. This is a digitally reconstructed radiograph um, from CT information, and I'm comparing it on the right-hand side with um, a properly scaled image, uh, uh, mega voltage image through that electronic portal imaging uh, uh, detector. However, we've also developed in-house uh, tools uh, for looking at, uh, specific, specifically for looking at um, um, uh, treatment reproducibility. And for prostate patients, for example, um, we've been, um, we've been in injecting them with gold seeds so as part of uh, initial biopsy, we've been implanting three gold seeds. Uh, the radiologists were trained to, uh, to do that. And in fact, we've been imaging them over a, period, over a year now. And um, we've been looking at specifically, how does the prostate move around as a function of time? And this is something that's been looked at by hundreds of different centers. Um, basically, the, the claim to fame that we make is that we did this in a very systematic fashion, and we were doing this for every fraction for several patients. So we have a data group now consisting of 20 patients where we have very detailed data. And I don't want to mislead you and make, make you think that we didn't use the information. In fact, correction in terms of patient position was made as a function of time for this study. Um, it's just that the initial errors, the initial um, differences between our reference images and the, the uh, uh, treatment images uh, in fact, um, were recorded as part of, as part of this detailed study. Um, software developed in-house by Ernest Osei actually um, has made this a lot easier for us. And um, Another person participating in this is uh, Renny Zhang. Uh, Renny Zhang um, is a seasoned graduate student. Uh, she already had a PhD um, um, when she came to us from China. Um, but um, she's working on basically a North American PhD um, uh, with uh, Jeff Chen and myself. And she's done some very good work as well. And in particular, um, she's looking at um, um, incorporating organ motion into the treatment planning process. So the treatment planning process that I described initially is really a static process. So you take a, a snapshot of the anatomy and in fact, you perform dose calculations on a static anatomy. But in fact, we're all moving. Uh, we've got um, um, uh, hopefully hearts beating and lungs pumping, and uh, we um, we want to keep it that way. And we also want to incorporate organ motion into the treatment planning process to better understand what the the the, um, the real tolerances are, and in fact, uh, what our expectations are in terms of delivery of radiation and sparing critical organs. So this was the uh, Prolock software that I uh, previously referred to developed in-house.
And so what we have here is a distribution of basically the position. So these, um, these data represent um, over time, basically, um, the difference between your reference images. So when you start the process, you tattoo the patient as part of the initial imaging process. The patient has had seeds in from the very beginning. And in fact, you have reference seed positions and reference anatomical positions. Um, you would expect there to be, with re respect to skin tattoos, some movement with respect to um, the positioning of the patient. And what I mean by that is that every day you set up the patient to these tattoos, but if the patient's muscle tone is a little different or they've lost weight or they're uncomfortable, um, you'll find that basically their bony anatomy will shift relative to those marks. In addition, the prostate, although it's not floating like in a goldfish bowl, it also has its own degrees of freedom. And so, in fact, as part of this study, we were looking at the seed positioning uh, displacement, positioning of bone, so bony landmarks. Uh, the seed position was defined basically by the center of mass of the seeds, uh, a vector in a, in a plane that contains all three of them, um, and relative to its initial position. And same thing with the bone. And in fact, the resultant, um, uh, um, the resultant distribution reflects that uh, first of all, the motion in the, the, um, the different directions, the different orthogonal directions, um, is different. Um, shown here are AP, left, right, and soup, inth uh, directions. Um, and that information is extremely useful in doing pre-planning because it tells you what your tolerances are. So by studying how, how things move when you treat, you have a much better idea what kind of margins you should apply to the initial target volumes. Um, it gives them a lot more credibility um, in terms of um, what you're trying to treat and achieve as part of treatment. The other thing we looked at basically was, was how to, um, to incorporate the, uh, this movement uh, into the dose calculations. and. It's been fairly well published that if you use a probability density function um, for the contours of patients, um, that the uh, convolution of that probability density function uh, with the static dose will give you, in fact, a reasonable picture of how, of, of how the dose changes with internal organ motion. So if you were able to map the, the, um, the motion of all your internal organs with different probability density functions, and you had access to all that data, you could plow through this and, in fact, come up with a, um, um, essentially a three-dimensional um, um, representation of how the dose relative to the static distribution uh, was affected. But another way to look at this is that um, you can, in fact, uh, take the directional derivative. So if you know something a priori about the motion, um, in fact, you can look along particular directions. and. Uh, with a bit of math, it can be shown that if I know what the directional uh, um, derivative is, I can convolve that with the probability density function and then integrate that along a pathway to determine how the dose is, the dose profile is modified along that direction. And so if you know that in a particular direction you've got this change in, in position, you can in fact predict what the impact is going to be and how um, the, um, uh, the dose distribution will be modified. And another really important aspect of this work um, is that the focus is on the dose gradient, which is where you want it to be. One of the tools that we look at um, rather exhaustively is something called the dose volume histogram. Now, the dose volume histogram is a very useful tool, but it doesn't tell you where in the patient that the dose that, that, you're, um, that you're quantifying actually is. Um, the dose gradient is something that you would expect coming through the optimizer, coming through commercial optimizers, would be basically uh, as steep as it could be. But the interesting thing is when you look at a lot of optimization solutions, they just satisfy your basic objective. They don't go any further than that. And so for a number of patients, we've found that you need to look carefully at the dose gradient. And that could be an exhaustive process if you have to look at it in every possible direction. And so if you know, again, a priori what, what directions you're seeing the motion for internal organs, for example, um, that will help you uh, uh, pin down um, where the dose is going to change the most. Um, this just shows you the, um, on, for this particular graph, the dose profile as a function of different plan. 
So depending on whether you use a five beam or a seven beam plan, and depending on how hard you work at actually pulling um, the, the dose, making the dose gradient steep, and you can do that by playing around with the objective constraints, um, you can see a fair difference in solutions. So what I'm saying is that the optimized solution is not necessarily optimum. And so you have to look carefully if you want to um, um, in, improve a plan. And this is where to look. And you need to look in, in, uh, in planes that, uh, that are um, um, not necessarily in the direction of, of the motion. You need to look in, in several principal planes. So this is a strong framework for assessing the impact of internal organ motion, and it provides a focus on dose gradient as a metric for IMRT quality. And I'd like you to think about that taking it forward to CyberKnife, because CyberKnife is an area where this technology, this, this idea actually, I think, would, would, uh, could, be, could be developed. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, blast through the radiobiology part. Radiobiology is fundamental to radiation oncology. And so a good understanding of radiobiology is, is how we're going to go forward with this. This is how we're going to provide benefit to patients. Um, standard um, radiobiology includes something called the linear quadratic model, and the survival is basically, uh, um, this is cell survival, is determined by a simple uh, linear quadratic function. In this particular relationship, n is the number of fractions, uh, d is the dose per fractions, and alpha and beta are coefficients applying to a particular cell type. In practice, alpha and beta are different for cell types, and they're different even for the same cell type in, in, um, in different tumors. And so this is not an exact science, is the message, but the principles um, are very useful. And this shows surviving fraction for two different types of cells, late responding. Late responding um, indicates that the um, uh, the uh, quadratic coefficient would be higher, and so in fact the d squared term would dominate in the linear quadratic, and the tumor and early responding tissues are the exact opposite, where the linear term would dominate. And we think we have a reasonable idea of these coefficients uh, for some tumors that we treat, and the response level of the effect is basically given by the negative log of the linear quadratic equation. But the important, the really important message that I wanted to deliver is the difference between alpha and beta for normal and for uh, uh, tumor tissues. Because, um, and this is where the, um, the difficulty comes in, um, you're, you're always delivering radiation to a tumor at the expense of some radiation to normal tissue. And that's really the game, is you want to get as much radiation in to the tumor as possible and spare surrounding tissue. However, for any particular disease site, the uh, normal tissue surrounding it may or may, well, it may be uh, more radiosensitive. And so you need to look at relative radiosensitivity and the amount of, of uh, healthy tissue involved in, in the uh, treatment delivery. And that's where um, IGRT, IMRT, we're changing basically physicians' perspectives on the radiobiology because we're able to get the dose to conform, we're able to spare healthy surrounding tissue. So we're rewriting the experience and the rules for our radiation oncologists with this technology. Um, specifically, we're going to um, uh, hypofractionation, fewer number of fractions, um, escalated dose. Although the four R's of radiobiology still apply, um, we need to be looking at them in a different context. And I'm just going through fractionation with uh, time factors. And so this slide basically summarizes what I, what I just said. And um, with something like CyberKnife, where, in fact, you can deliver the radiation very precisely, very conformally, um, the question is, can you do it and only consider the tumor itself and forget all about the alpha and beta of normal tissue? That's really what it comes down to. Can I focus on the tumor characteristics alone in eradicating it? Well, the, um, the next uh, series of uh, slides are essentially the commercial, and I apologize for them in advance. Um, I just borrowed them because they were actually quite useful. We don't have CyberKnife technology yet. I did go to Beth Israel in Boston and had a good look at the treatment planning system and talked to the physicists there. 
Um, this represents um, uh, basically the um, what, I, what, I, what I call now the pinnacle of IGRT technology, in that, as I said, the beam actually tracks with the tumor. And it started off as a, a radio surgery tool, radio surgery being for arteriovenous malformations or very, very small tumors, small being uh, prostate, for example, the average volume is around 50 cubic centimeters. Um, so the kinds of tumors that you would treat with this technology are below 50 cubic centimeters, typically, um, which means that it is somewhat limited. But if we can get uh, patients uh, who have been diagnosed early, and in fact we can use this technology, you can use it for more than just um, uh, cranial treatments. And in fact, the original uh, um, uh, use for it was strictly cranial, so strictly for um, 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 head and neck tumors. But um, it has uh, gone beyond um, uh, um, that, and, and it's being used for lung, for liver, for prostate, uh, for breast, uh, and a number of other sites. Um, so just to compare it, just a bit of history on, on radiosurgery. Radiosurgery has been around for a long time. Um, there are dedicated cobalt devices. Um, a commercial name for them are, are gamma knife. Um, Radio surgery is is, uh, is is certainly less invasive than surgery if you can do the job, which makes it um, uh, tremendously uh, uh, powerful. Um, histor uh, uh, historically, it has been somewhat limited uh, because of accuracy and um, uh, because of patient movement. Um, so you can modify a linear accelerator, for example, Brain Lab uh, commercially sell. Um, uh, microleaf collimators that you can fasten to the head of an accelerator to give you similar precision to, to gamma knife. Uh, but, but again, the, the, um, you're still limited to, in the case of a linear accelerator, to um, um, cylindrical, um, uh, a cylindrical arc. And the other part of this is that um, in the past, typically you have to bolt a frame to the skull of the patient in order to establish a coordinate system to give you the precision. Uh, so the patient is imaged with a frame bolted to their head and then, in fact, fastened to the treatment couch and the treatment is delivered with that frame in place. So where does CyberKnife come in? Well, CyberKnife actually, um, it allows you to, to deliver radiation anywhere in the body um, and it, it, they are claiming submillimeter accuracy. Um, there's been a lot of publications about the accuracy of the device, and so I, I, I truly believe that it, it is capable of delivering it. In talking to the physicists uh, in Boston, I was uh, impressed, actually, with the, certainly with the phantom work that, that they had done. Um, so this represents advanced image guidance. Uh, this system has, as part of its delivery, a system for sensing changes in the position of the tumor. And so if, the, if, if from the, it has, uh, and I'll, I'll, so as part of this device, it has basically overhead uh, two x-ray units that um, expose uh, amorphous silicon flat panel detectors in the floor. And it's, it, it, they are fixed in space. And in fact, um, the coach is designed so that you can move the patient uh, and to, to acquire these images, but um, the point is that whatever your reference images are, whatever your, um, uh, your, your DRRs, your reference DRRs, it can calculate them on the fly and detect, for example, without any fixation device, whether the tumor has changed position. And so, in fact, this robotic arm painstakingly goes through um, uh, temporal uh, imaging, uh, dynamic imaging, um, to basically um, uh, track the tumor and deliver the prescribed radiation. So you don't need body frames, ideally. And the other important aspect is the treatment is non-isocentric. I didn't mention that for megavoltage treatment units, typically you are treating um, through a, um, a, a point called an isocenter, which means that all the beams that are incident on the patient basically go through that, that that isocenter. With CyberKnife, in fact, you're looking at a region, and the two, the, the um, basically the um, the lines, the, the line of the of the radiation, is not necessarily going through the same point. 
And so, in fact, uh, that represents uh, another degree of freedom and allows you a lot more beam shaping uh, capability. So some basic features, uh, 600 monarchy unit per minute Linux um, in-floor imaging system and um, a control detection system. Um, there are basically six degrees of freedom of this, uh, of this unit. <clears throat> and so it rotates about, uh, it's actually used to manufacture cars um, in, in Europe when it's not doing this. There is a, um, um, as I said, there's, the, there's uh, two systems actually for uh, tracking the tumor within patients. One of them is called synchrony and the other is called excite. With synchrony, you're actually looking at fiducials inside the patient radiographically and the patient wears a vest with LEDs on it and the LEDs are monitored externally. And it is through the synchrony of the patient's breathing, so the rising and falling of their chest, plus the internal tracking of the, uh, your fiducials or bony landmarks that provides the ability of the machine to basically track uh, for uh, the treatment of lung tumors. That's essentially the way in which uh, CyberKnife is, is doing that. And yeah, forgive me for showing this slide. <clears throat> this is part of the commercial representation and so you can see the the flashing of the, uh, the uh, x-ray units for the monitoring and so the image detectors are in the floor This particular slide, um, they were, um, they have basically improved the dose rate. One of the areas that needs to be developed with CyberKnife is a larger field size. They have right now a system of collimators where the device, if it needs a larger shape, basically takes time, goes over, um, uh, pulls the collimator that that's required off the shelf, and the process continues. And so, I think to have a micro um, MLC type collimator for this device would be a huge improvement. So this is the respiratory tracking system that I was talking about. On the right you can see the um, patient has a vest on and this vest is basically imaged. The LEDs from that vest are imaged um, with a separate uh, camera system. In addition, the radiographic, as I said, the radiographic um, system is looking at uh, fiducial markers uh, moving inside the patient. And so you synchronize um, um, the two of them as part of um, following and tracking the tumor. So near real time, this device is tracking the motion of the tumor. So a number of patients have been treated this way uh, uh, very successfully. There's been a lot of um, data published, fairly early data published. Um, the message from the, uh, the CyberKnife vendors is that um, you know, static pre-planning is not enough. And in fact, you have to track because the patient moves. And even with the mobilization devices, uh, there is internal organ motion. And so uh, you need to have a system like this if you really want to offer image-guided radiation therapy. And so they have a separate system called Excite. Um, this turns out to be a uh, 2D to 2D image co-registration between um, DRRs that you uh, reference DRRs and images taken through the, the imaging system. And the way it works is, in fact, you, you identify a number of um, 
uh, reference points or control points, and you basically look at how the, that array of control points maps um, from the, the, um, the imaging system during treatment. And depending on how it maps, you basically get a number of uh, uh, difference vectors. And the difference vector set is what is used to modify the position of treatment delivery of the robotic head. So I have reference um, digitally reconstructed radiographs from CT. And I have a grid on those representing my control points. And then I map my control points so it warps depending on the uh, motion of the patient. And I get these displacement fields, which then become part of the, um, the information that's used to change the position of the robotic head during delivery. And this system has been um, used uh, successfully. It's somewhat proprietary. I've tried to dig and get more information than is available through um, simple publications. And uh, until you're an owner, um, you don't really know exactly how it works, but so far, so good. The, you might say, well, what good is it um, compared to other technologies? The point is that if you have spinal disease, disease very close to the spinal cord, um, very, very close um, to the optic nerve, for example, um, you, in fact, have uh, a good tool for irradiating and sparing surrounding tissue. And this particular slide emphasizes the fact that although with stereotactic systems, it's fine to talk about the beam diameter, for example, and precise delivery to a phantom. But with uh, image guided, with near real time tracking of the tumor, the clinical accuracy is much improved with this system. They're quoting less than one millimeter. The quality assurance measurements that have been taken with phantoms, including breathing phantoms, is actually um, very impressive. It's less than uh, half a millimeter. Their treatment planning system, although it's shown here as, as being a strength, needs some development. So compared to external beam systems, the tools, I didn't find the tools as useful. It's not easy to integrate treatment planning that's been done on, on commercial systems involving uh, um, external beam treatment, say, on one machine if you wanted to do a boost. Um, there's no reason at all why CyberKnife couldn't be used for, for uh, providing uh, uh, boosts on patients that have received uh, treatment uh, previously. Um, even though the, um, the treatment system allows you to work with DVHs, it doesn't allow you to wait or use DVHs as part of the planning. So the planning optimization, the objective function is a little bit limited currently. And I think it's an area where of, of uh, potential development. And I'll um, just go through these process slides quickly. And the case studies for a meningioma, um, tumor volume of 3.2 cubic centimeters, so not very large. Um, this shows the DVH um, of the tumor volume, which is in red. And then all of the other sites, the optic uh, chiasm, the brain stem, um, uh, lower on the left the way you would want them. And for this particular patient, um, patient's uh, image uh, uh, vision rather was, uh, was restored in one eye and the other eye was completely spared with this technique. Another patient, uh, a lung cancer patient, a non-small cell lung carcinoma, this was an elderly uh, uh, lady, um, tumor volume 14 cubic centimeters. And basically with a number of, uh, shown on the upper left, it looks like porcupine spikes. These are the individual directions of all the beams intersecting the tumor. And in fact, um, the, the, um, the, the radiation was delivered very precisely. And then post-treatment, um, it basically looks like a surgical resection. And then the last example, again, was a um, left optic nerve and similar kind of conformal delivery. And these are three examples of many that um, 
have been treated with this new technology. So just uh, briefly, um, operationally we're funded through the ministry um, at the Cancer Centre by the number of patients that we actually see annually. So it's a, it's a very straightforward funding formula and we sort of, um, we're, we're, we're made to conform to it. Um, the real interesting problem with it is that going forward, how can cancer centers embrace new technology? So how can we go to the ministry and tell them that the, we need basically more money to do the same thing? And so that's sort of what the CyberKnife project is about. New technologies such as tomotherapy um, gradually work their way into the province. Um, we don't have PET imaging yet. That is the, there's a provincial moratorium on, on PET imaging, uh, unfortunately, currently. But, but issues um, that prevent us from actually going forward are things that we need to lobby loudly um, about. And so wanting to, to acquire a cyber knife is something that we have to emphatically um, push in front of the ministry, telling them why we think it's good technology, why we want to go forward with it. And as part of that, it's really important that we, um, that we come to the University of Waterloo and try and do uh, collaborative research. And so that's, again, uh, coming back to the original message. Um, why choose CyberKnife over Linux technology? Well, it's, it's near real-time tumor tracking, um, which makes it unique, currently unique. Um, the, with tomotherapy collimation, it's, it actually is, is limited in terms of resolution and it's also limited to arc geometries. Pretreatment imaging assumes no motion during treatment. So a low tomotherapy has the ability to correct after the fact or to at least see that the patient has moved. Um, there's nothing that it can do during uh, treatment, not easily, uh, to in fact change the position of the couch. Um, for modified Linux setups, they're cumbersome because if you have a separate collimator that you have to fix to the head, you've got to be um, uh, mechanically uh, doing a lot of work, uh, which is not ideal in a patient, uh, in a clinical setting where you have to get a lot of patients through. Um, and you have a separate treatment planning system uh, typically, so there's a lot of quality assurance associated with flipping your machine, toggling your machine between uh, stereotactic and non-stereotactic modes. Um, and further, the modified Linac emplo employs orthogonally mounted KV verification imaging. So real-time KV imaging may not be available in the direction of the treatment beam, and I talked about that initially. So that's, that's a, a problem with it. Um, so there's unique potential for the University of Waterloo and, and Grand River Regional Cancer Center um, uh, to, um, to pursue CyberKnife. Uh, first of all, patients will benefit from this technology, there is no doubt. Um, it will help us to acquire, right now we don't have uh, neurosurgeons in the region. Um, even though we can use this technology at a distance, we'd like to try and attract neurosurgeons uh, to this area. This is one way of doing it. Um, there's a lot of expertise here at the University of Waterloo. Um, um, we can certainly employ that in a number of different directions to improve this, this technology. We believe we have expertise. We've demonstrated some of that in the front end of this talk. Um, we currently have an empty bunker um, that you could put a Linac into or you could put a CyberKnife into. So um, that um, is unique as well. That kind of real estate isn't around. Um, we, just, uh, um, we just happen to be in that position right now, so it makes it uh, extremely attractive. Informatics, uh, in terms of uh, research and development opportunities, uh, development of treatment verification and evaluation tools, image management tools, um, the, uh, the interesting thing is when you look across the region, um, Cambridge Memorial has Phillips PAX, uh, St. Mary's has AGFA PAX, we have Siemens PAX. It would be great if we had some kind of regional, um, I'll call it DICOM RT PAX uh, that, uh, and, and there's, I think, great potential for that to be developed right here. <laughs> um, I believe we can improve the real-time tumor tracking system. I think Excite and Synchrony are, are decent tools, but it looked to me that there's a lot of, a lot of potential for improving those. The treatment, treatment planning system improvement to me is obvious as well. Um, inverse optimization to include dose gradient. As I mentioned before, the dose gradient is something that um, when you look at the CyberKnife dose distributions, it's clear that the dose gradient from those distributions 
is greater than the dose gradient from LINAC based systems. So in fact, you can see that it conforms, but nobody's really picked up on this and quantifying the, that particular aspect of the treatment planning. Um, the, um, the important aspect, again, with CyberKnife is that you're, you're tracking the tumor real time. So that, is, that, is, that gain is realized by the patient. That's not potential gain on a plan that may or may not be delivered by the LINAC. So um, Monte Carlo dose modeling is uh, something that uh, could be considered. Um, right now, it's a fairly primitive dose model. And you might think, well, you don't need anything too sophisticated. It's a very narrow beam. You're not talking about scattered radiation. You're talking about simple attenuation along a ray line. Um, I think it's important that, um, that, that we look carefully at that, uh, particularly when you're going through bone and lung. Um, development of large field dose delivery is something I, I mentioned the micro MLC as a, uh, as a possibility. And then finally, basic radiobiology, uh, the maximum uh, uh, tolerated dose and hypofractionation. Going forward with this proposal, we've been working with um, Bazador Creativity um, out of Waterton, um, Hamilton. Um, and we have a proposal that we're working on internally and we want to bring that to, the, to Cancer Care Ontario. The, um, the point is that we would like to have discussions with interested parties at University of Waterloo and have potential research ideas, uh, plans going forward to present with that. Um, and so we need to try and, um, we, need, we need to encourage these discussions, we need to get some ideas, uh, we need to get some feedback. Um, so that was the purpose of this talk and I guess we'll run it again in the fall or something similar. Um, and we want to uh, submit this formally in the fall. Um, it's going forward to, to some degree right now, but essentially, um, we would sure like to work with you. Um, it's been our goal all along to do that. I think looking out in the audience, um, I see the face of uh, at least one person that has the remember me look. And um, when we first came in, we had uh, visions of grandeur and we haven't been able to live up to that uh, to the degree that I would have liked, um, largely because uh, putting together a new cancer center has been uh, resource consuming and we lost a few people along the way and so we had to step back a little bit. But as I said, we've gained a few new minds in the department and we want to step forward again. And uh, so we want to, um, to, we want, we want to initiate a new discussion and uh, hopefully we can establish, uh, looking at uh, Dominique, a new commitment. Um, so that's all I have to say, uh, questions. Thank you. So we'd like to just give you a chance to make comments and ask questions. Uh, if you just give me a high sign, I'll get the microphone to you, or surely will. Uh, I have a question about the synchrony system with the CyberNet. Uh How often are the x-ray images being up, uh, updated, and what's the lag on the control system itself? I don't know what the lag is. The, um, in terms of the frequency, it is adjustable, and you can do it as often as every minute, um, um, which is what I saw clinically. So. I don't know what the lag is. It's a, it's a good question. Typical treatments last about, there has to be some lag. Typical treatments last 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So this is not a fast technology currently. So the good news is that the patient isn't, isn't confined to a mobilization, mobilization apparatus, but that lag comes into the uh, treatment times. Jeff. Um. Son, uh, you had mentioned a couple years ago about uh, Calypso, I think it was called, the Calypso. GPS sort of thing. Yes. Any uh, movement on that? or Still non-clinical, so it's still undergoing clinical trials, but there has been some really good uh, information reported with it. What Jeff is referring to is uh, essentially uh, transducers that are implanted surgically, um, which have the ability to be detected with um, um, basically electromagnetic technology. So in fact, um, without the use of radiation, you can in fact look at motion of the prostate and basically connect it, use it to control whether or not you continue to treat a patient. And so if you know where the prostate should be, for example, if they're implanted in the prostate, you can in fact monitor them uh, during treatment. And if in fact the position of the prostate varies, goes outside of tolerance, then you'd stop and you'd uh, reposition the patient and then continue treating. 
But that, that is a very, that technology is actually, um, it is going forward. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, with the cyber knife, do they actually, you know, when, when the, the tumor is moving, and fine, you can track the tumor, but what about the other tissues nearby? And do, they don't explicitly track the optic nerve. Well, I guess if it's, if it's in the head, I guess they assume it's all fixed. But what about uh, something in the soft tissue and the abdomen or something? They don't explicitly track anything other than the tumor. Not that sophisticated yet. But again, uh, reasonable direction for development. Uh, first, I'd like to thank for your uh, uh, very informative presentation. Um, I have two questions. The first one, I'd like to know how do you measure the radiation effect on the uh, tissue phantom? Um, the, second uh, the second question is, is the tracking algorithm um, a linear base, a linear model base, or do you use any nonlinear um, systems? The um, and I'm sorry to say that um, I I wasn't able to get the information I wanted to present on the tracking system. It is proprietary, and you they have a CyberKnife users group. Uh, sorry to, to to sort of sidestep your question for a second. But um, you can't get near the information you want, really, until you sort of sign on the dotted line. And uh, it's a bit of a frustration. In talking to the physicists, um, some of the people that I think should know more about how the, the, the system works uh, don't. And uh, so it's, it's um, something that I think as we pursue, um, we'll be able to get more information on. But I can't tell you the, I, I haven't seen the model. I haven't seen good, what I would call good white papers describing to me um, satisfactorily how this technology really works. Um, in terms of the phantom information, um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, you, um, maybe I didn't make it clear. The kind of phantoms that you can design are, are basically breathing phantoms or phantoms that um, um, have motion associated with them, programmable motion. And then the point is that um, the studies that have been done so far have basically um, set the, the motion of the object uh, to um, extreme frequencies and extreme amplitudes in order to see how well it could track. And for the most part, within the, the, um, the, the kind of model parameters that you would need to, uh, to use for breathing, um, it, it tracks satisfactorily uh, to, again, to a precision of less than a millimeter. Right. I mean, um, the radiation effect of tissue phantom, um, for example, do you measure its temperature after uh, the radiation? Or do you measure the uh, the change of uh, properties uh, of the of the phantom? You can use different different um, uh, dosimeters. Typically, we use ionization dosimeters. Um, you can use film. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that we have these amorphous silicon flat panel monitors. You can use MOSFET technology. Uh, you can use TLD. And looking up the very top of, of the audience on this side. We've also been doing some, some development, um, fundamental radiation dosimeter development with carbon nanotube technology. And I've been working with Xiaozi Ma and, uh, and uh, uh, John Yeo uh, on that as well. Sorry, did I, answer, uh, did I answer your question or are you still not? All right. Sorry, I think that your question is not uh, very accurately said it because uh, any phantom has no radiobiological effect. Uh, the phantom is not uh, a human tissue. The water is not a human tissue. So anything which, what you measure in the phantom uh, doesn't matter from what material is. You have a normalization coefficient to transfer the measured dose to a certain contour with specified alpha beta ratios. And after that, you can say, if here was a patient on the place on the phantom with this kind of contour and deliver dose, the probable radiological effect would be this kind. Absorbed dose is energy per unit mass. There is a small temperature increase associated with the absorption of that energy. But in fact, it's 10 to the minus 4 degrees, typically, for the kinds of doses that we'd be delivering. So it's very tiny. 
Uh, you, you mentioned that the, the treatment time is much longer with the CyberKnife system. I was wondering, uh, is this uh, hypofractionated down to a single fraction, and uh, what kind of doses are involved? For some, for some for tumors, some it, it has been. Um, and so you're looking at possibly uh, 30 gray or 30,000 centigray. Um, we would treat 50 gray over 30 fractions uh, for some of our conventional uh, treatments. Um, so, but, but the idea is with it, is that if I can avoid surrounding tissue, then I only have to focus on the tumor. And depending on the alpha beta characteristics of that tumor, the, the, um, um, I can deliver um, um, up to um, what is, is tolerated basically by that, by that tumor. So. Also, uh, you mentioned that uh, for the treatment planning system, you don't, it's not DBH constrained. What kind of uh, treatment planning do you do? Is it forward planned or? Well, ag again, it's, uh, I haven't had a chance to really play with it. But um, unlike conventional treatment planning systems that incorporate dose volume histograms and weight, the weighting of dose volume histograms, this is basically a, um, a system that allows you to put in up to 250 separate beams um, through the, the target volume. You, you wouldn't necessarily use all of them. And so basically you experiment by sampling and you basically try and use as few beams as possible to lower the treatment time. Um, and then basically you're looking at the summation of the delivery of, of, of all, those, um, all those beams. And basically it's a dose point constraint. Um, you basically define your target volume, you define your organs at risk, and then you tell it, I, want, I don't want any more than a particular dose at this point. And it basically provides um, um, an optimization uh, um, for that. But, uh, I don't know if, if it uses simulated annealing, for example, or how exactly the optimization algorithm works. Um, I'd like to know more about it. Um, this has sort of been a sore point with the vendor. In order to go forward to do, um, to do uh, research, you really need to have the infrastructure to do that. And so as a, um, basically as a condition of, of purchase, we would want to have that, a separate system for doing our developmental treatment planning and access to the algorithms and access to um, the information that would allow us to, in fact, do basic research. This is good. I was going to show you all the running. I don't know. I'm trying to understand how does the uh, cyber knife work. You have two X-ray um, generator on the top, and you're using that for imaging applications. Right. And I guess the, uh, the the head at the end of the robotic arm is that a linet, or yes, it is. So so the X-ray detector is well the generator on both sides. They are doing the imaging. It's and it's it's doing it's doing the tracking through the the fiducial on the vest. All right, so initially I've imaged the patient through CT, for example. And as part of the CT, I can generate digitally reconstructed radiographs corresponding to the, the exact direction of the beams in the ceiling through the patient. And so I have the reference images, and in addition to the reference images, um, I have, and that would be either uh, bony landmarks or I have fiducials. I would know where the tumor is relative to those fiducials. And so what I'm doing is I'm basically looking at how that position, the position of the tumor as detected through the original imaging has changed relative to the current imaging. So I'm looking not quite orthogonally at an image through the patient. And I'm basically doing a calculation on the fly to see how that information has essentially warped from the original plan. And then I tell the robotic arm, instead of the tumor being in this position, it's now slightly bent and it goes to the location that, um, that the, the algorithm they're using determines and then, and then treats it. And so that process represents the lag, the system lag, in terms of if it was in exactly the same position, no difference, it just goes and treats. Um, so my, my second question is, is there a business model for getting the cyber knife be, besides um, the patient getting better treatment? Would it be faster treatment time, so you have faster, more throughput through the hospital? What's the business model? That's a good question. Um, there's a couple of business models. Uh, one of them that is if you save patients, then it costs you less long term, and that's probably the best one. 
With this technology, you're never going to win on the treatment times because it's a slower technology. Um, we could improve it, but I don't see changing it by an order of magnitude, for example. Might change the treatment time marginally. It's a difficult issue. It really is a difficult issue. Because the ministry will say to us, well, how many patients are you going to treat with this a year? And, you know, by, I mean, we can sort of um, uh, fudge that a little bit by saying that we're using hypofractionation, so there's fewer fractions. It takes longer, but we're going to give you the same number of patients through at the end of the year. So it's that kind of a model that, um, that will probably help us um, get Thank funded. You. Quick questions. Uh, one, I may have been dreaming, but I think I read in one of my journals that there are substances that can be injected into the, uh, taken up by the tumor that actually increase the absorption of the radiation within the tumor. Is, is that a uh, bad memory or is that real? Um, and or be activated. In other words, that the, uh, that the material in the tumor actually becomes part of the active treatment. You familiar with anything like that? Or? Well, essentially, the, for, at this energy, the absorption physics are, are governed by Compton interactions. Um, mm -hmm. And Compton doesn't really have an atomic number preference. It basically, in terms of Strictly transfer electron. energy, it, it just sees electron clouds. Electron clouds. So I'm not sure. If it was diagnostic, uh, yes, possibly. And if it was really high energy, um, but, but not at Compton energies. Okay, okay, so that's probably wrong, uh, wrong information. Second was, uh, you're indicating that a lot of the things with this are proprietary, and uh, what is the potential of working with the vendor? That would seem almost crucial in making a decision. If we can't get the information from the vendor, then it seems like we're impaired about any kind of significant research. Um, it's a good point, Dominique. Um, we've been working for about a year um, with Accuray as the company, and the the problem is that um, I've really yet to speak to what I would consider as uh, like physicists or engineers that would give me the appropriate information, and it just it's uh, it's been a bit of a fight. But we've made it very clear, however, that we wouldn't purchase unless we had access to the appropriate research infrastructure, and um, so it's uh, if they want to sell one to us, um, that's. Yeah. I'm wondering if that's something where the university could bring such value to the table that it would be convincing. Without a know. doubt. In other words, you've got people like uh, Yao and uh, others within the university that bring to them capabilities they may not have. And uh, they might see it then as being more attractive to, to open the doors, if you want, and provide the information. Does that make sense? Or? It does. And uh, before purchase, too, and I, I didn't mention this, uh, I, I would like to go to USC where, it's, where, it's, where their primary development is taking place and talk to the appropriate people. And I've already lobbied for that. So, um, and presumably, they would want non-disclosures and things like that. But they will. Yeah, yeah. That, would be, that would be easily sealed. And um, the, uh, if I just quickly, just to finish this, could you, from your vantage point, if you had to name three areas of crucial research that would advance uh, the use of the cyber knife and the value for patients, what would those three top areas of potential research be? Uh, Real-time tracking, okay. um, large field dose delivery, large field and, and more rapid dose delivery, and radiobiology. Radiobiology, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Rob, uh, any other questions before I? Thank you very, very much for this. I appreciate it.